Okay, so the first question uh, someone posed is the uh, post lecture question that's asking about Nihan Teresa and their contributions. So the first thing when you're thinking when you see a question like this is this question is really trying to get at the idea or concept of what is the benefit to everyone who is in this particular market. So the first thing we need to know is that each individual can choose whether they're gonna contribute $300 to the botanical garden or keep $300 for a weekend getaway that they're going on. So because the botanical garden is a public good, both individuals will benefit from any contribution made by the other person. And specifically in this instance, every dollar that is either one of them contributes will bring each of them 90 cents of benefits. So there's a pretty significant multiplier effect for the benefits that each individual will get. So the second good is the weekend getaway. So this is a private good. So because it's a private good, it's only gonna benefit each person individually. Um, and what that means then is that if either individual chooses the weekend getaway, that other person is not gonna receive any of the benefit. So let's see what that's gonna look like. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna complete this table. Uh, and this table is really important because it's telling us a couple different things. So the first thing is that it's showing us depending on the person, what is the total value if both of them contribute versus if one or none of them contribute. So you can see that we already have the first value filled out here. And we also have the second value filled out here. So what we then need to do is compute the other two values. And so I've done that here and kind of broken it out to see what that looks like. So the first piece is, you'll see that uh, it's asking if Niha, if she contributes, and Teresa, if she doesn't contribute, what is gonna be the payout? So we can probably assume that it's gonna be $840, but I did just kind of wanna walk through that in what that would look like. So what that's gonna look like is you're going to have to take the $300 that Nia contributes multiply by the multiplier that they mention in the problem, or in, which in this case is 90 cents. And you're gonna to have to do that twice, because remember, even though Mia's contributing that money, that money's going to get multiplied for both individuals. So it's almost like both individuals are contributing, even though only one individual is. Okay, so we've done that, we've done the multiplier. So we have 300 times the 90 cents and 300 times the 90 cents. But then because Teresa is not contributing, she's taking the private getaway, then that value of $300 is only hers. So because of that, it's going to be $840. So that's how you get 840 in this as well as here. For the final one that we're being asked to contribute or to uh, fill in, it's basically just 300 plus 300 is 600 because each individual is having their private contribution and that's not benefiting the other individual. Okay. So the next table is asking us what happens or what are the individual benefits? And in this case, what we need to do is we need to compute the individual benefits of Nia. So in this case, we can see that once again, $300 for the benefit. And because Therese is not contributing, it's just going to be the $270 that Nia is getting. For this one, it's just the 300 because Nia is not contributing either. So note that the worst outcome here is going to be the outcome where Nia contributes, but Teresa does not contribute. So that's always gonna be the worst outcome. And that is an example 
of a free rider problem because as we can see up here, both individuals have an incentive not to contribute because they personally get more if they don't contribute and the other person does. So because of that, we have this issue of the free rider problem. So because both individuals are better off if they let the other person contribute. And what this means is just that basically each individual has an incentive not to contribute because they personally gain more in this case. Um, and in this specific case, if they don't contribute and the other person does, they get a vacation and they get the benefits of the botanical gardens. So that's an example of the free rider problem and how you can kind of put some math to the free rider problem. Okay. So the next question I got was, how do you find fixed costs? So the question was first asking about fixed costs in the sense of a graph. So how do you find the fixed costs when looking at a graph? So the first thing you need to know is that this point right here, the intersection of the marginal cost curve and the average variable cost curve, this is going to be where they are going to choose to contribute that or to produce. That is going to be the site where the firm chooses its production because the firm to produce needs to just cover its average variable costs. That's it. That's the only thing the firm cares about to be able to know when it's going to produce. So then you'll see I've drawn this line here that is showing the intersection of the marginal cost curve and the average variable cost curve. So I'm going to go all the way up to the average total cost curve. And this difference right here is going to be the dollar difference that I'm going to have to take and this price difference right here. So this piece is going to give me all the information I need because I need the quantity and the difference between this price here and this price here. And so for this problem, um, it's I kind of approximated it just because it's not exactly clear where it is. So I said it's 1175 minus 425, which I believe is this point here and this point here. It could be 11, it could be four, it kind of depends. Um, but in this case, approximation is okay. And then I multiplied it by the quantity, which in this case to me looks like it's about 7.5. So that gives us 56.25, which we will round to, in this case, $56. So the other way to calculate total fixed costs is to look at the total cost calculation. So basically what we have here is we have the total costs equals fixed cost plus variable cost. So if we're ever asked or uh, given a problem where we know the total cost and the variable cost, all we need to do is just treat this as the variable or the fixed cost as the variable and then solve for the problem. So that's how you compute or calculate the fixed cost if you have uh, variable cost and total cost. Okay. So the next question was asking about uh, the two different countries and their production of genes and corn. So the first thing you need to do is when you're looking at this, what you wanna say is that look at the opportunity cost of producing one pair of genes. So if you're trying to produce genes, you know that corn is gonna go on the top. So corn's gonna go up here, genes are gonna go down here, which is gonna give you two units of corn. And to carry that further, if we're looking at the other country's opportunity cost, it's going to be one pair of genes is going to be 32 units of corn over eight units of genes. So 32 over eight, which is going to give us four. So then because of that, the two to four ratio, we know that Arcadia is going to have a comparative advantage in the production of genes 
because they have a lower opportunity cost of genes than Felicidad does. And we can say that Felicidad has a comparative advantage in the production of corn. So that's how we know the, who is going to have a comparative advantage in which good. So to take that further, we're then given the amount of labor hours each country has to expend to produce the good. So what happens then is we are told that we have 4 million labor hours and we can produce 12 genes per hour. So we know then that we can produce 48 million genes in Arcadia and for Felicidad, it's the same 4 million times 32 uh, units of corn per hour, which gives us 128 million. So taking that even further, if we're asked to fill out this table, that's basically saying, what is their production without trade, with trade, and what is the increase? So what we can do is say we know their production and consumption without trade is going to be the 12 million because they produce and consume everything since they're not trading. The same is true for corn. Uh, the same is true for Felicidad for genes and corn as well. So what happens with trade? So we know with trade from the calculation up here that Arcadia is going to produce 48 million units of genes and Felicidad is going to produce 128 million units of corn. So we plug in 48 here. Really important that because Arcadia is specializing in genes, they're going to produce zero units of corn. The same is true for Felicidad, except the opposite. So they're going to produce zero units of genes and 128 units of corn. So then because of that, we know that Felice or Arcadia is going to export 26 units of the good to Felicidad. So that's going to go over there. And for corn, the opposite, Felicidad is going to export corn to Arcadia. And that gives them the total amounts that they end with. So note here, and this is the really important piece. We see that both countries are gaining from trade in this, uh, in this trade. And that has to be true. And that's how you can determine the exact amount of the good that they are going to uh, obtain. So you can determine the terms of trade by looking at the production and the opportunity cost. Because there's never going to be a situation where a country is going to trade outside of those two boundaries. Because if they trade outside of their opportunity costs, they're going to be losing from trade, which in this case will never happen. Okay. So then the next question was asking about negative externalities and the impact to consumer surplus that they have. So here is a kind of traditional negative externality graph. We have the supply and the new supply, which is also the social cost of the negative externality. So the first thing to note is before we have the externality, the negative externality, this pink area is the consumer surplus. This green area is the producer surplus. So after the social cost is included in the calculation and we have the higher price and lower quantity, what then happens is producer surplus, and let me highlight it while I'm talking. So producer surplus is now this area. So this is the new producer surplus, just this small triangle. Consumer surplus is just this upper triangle. And the reason for that is because when the social cost is considered, consumer surplus and producer surplus should be reduced because the overall quantity produced in the market is too high and the price is too low when you don't consider the social cost. Okay, 
And so then if we're looking at the exact opposite, the reverse is gonna be true for something with a positive externality or a social benefit. So in this case, we're looking at here, something with a social benefit and we can see, and I will once again highlight. So when the correct social benefit is included, this is all of the producer surplus. So notice quite a big chunk. For the consumer surplus, this is the new consumer surplus. So note that when we include the social benefit, the actual social benefit curve, the consumer surplus and producer surplus increases because with a positive externality, consumption should be higher and the price is also higher. Okay. So then the next question is asking about trade with tariffs and what specifically happens with a tariff. And so I kind of tried to draw what the graph would look like. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit so we can see everything. Okay. So in this example here, we can very clearly see that the impact of a tariff is reducing consumer surplus because consumer surplus without the tariff is this yellow line. So this is consumer surplus without the tariff. But when there is a tariff added, we then have consumer surplus being reduced to the green triangle and producer surplus increases to the pink triangle. And we have this chunk of deadweight loss, this chunk of deadweight loss, in this tariff revenue. And so remember to compute deadweight loss, what we need to do is calculate the one half base times height formula for both of these triangles. And for the tariff, we need to do the length times width formula for a rectangle. So that's how we determine the deadweight loss and the impact to consumer and producer surplus. So just kind of to summarize that, because I know that was a lot, if there is a tariff, consumer surplus is reduced and producer surplus is increased if it is in an import market. And so if we wanted to hypothetically calculate the deadweight loss for one of the triangles, just to kind of see what that would look like, it's gonna be something like this. So we have the one half and why don't I do it for this triangle? So you have one half base times height. And then in this case, we're doing the base is gonna be 205 and 125. So we're gonna have 205 minus 125. Multiply that by the difference of the tariff. So the height right here, which in this case is the difference between 280 and 180. So we're gonna have 280 minus 180. And so we're gonna solve this to determine that this deadweight loss triangle right here. And then for the tariff, if we wanted to compute the tariff, we would basically take the difference between the 290 and 205. So 290 minus 205, and then multiply that by the amount of the tariff, which in this case is a dollar. And that's how you would determine tariff revenue. Okay, and I think that is actually the perfect finishing point. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, the exam uh, for the midterm is gonna be on Sunday, November 15th. So just kind of a heads up, I'll shoot some more information out a little bit later on that, uh, later this week, because next week I'm just gonna be spending the entire class time doing a review. So anyone is welcome to join. 
So have a great rest of your week and uh, try to stay sane and relax. Uh, enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. So why don't we get started then? And just as a reminder, kind of the general uh, 
process is just if you have a question on anything I'm saying, please feel free to either unmute yourself or type in the chat window. Okay, so the first question I received was asking about the impact of kind of the uh, impact of negative externalities on consumer and producer surplus. So it, it, it's an interesting question. And I think one of the best ways to think about it is to think about it as if you're looking at a graph. So in this case, we can see the graph here has supply demand, so normal supply demand graph, and we have our normal consumer surplus and producer surplus. So note that the biggest thing about a negative externality is you know that there should be a lower quantity produced in the market and the price should be higher. So what happens then is when you write or draw the social cost curve, this right here, you'll notice that both consumer surplus is decreased. So consumer surplus now is this brown outline and producer surplus is also decreased to this gray outline. And so part of the reason for that is because as I already mentioned, we have this difference between what the price and quantity should be and what the price and quantity is in the market. So if the social or the negative externality is not rectified, what happens is you have too much quantity produced in too little price. So that is why it's always really important that the government has some sort of tax or some way to negate the negative externality. And so just kind of to reiterate, when you are internalizing the externality, that means you need to make sure that the market price is increased and the quantity produced is decreased. And one of the ways to do this is through a corrective tax. And this is one of the most common ways uh, to rectify a negative externality. Okay, so the next question was asking about trade with tariffs. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you all can see this. So the first thing to notice is that when we have trade with tariffs, there is a loss in consumer surplus in this example of the yellow outline. The second thing to note is that producer surplus with tariffs are increasing. So domestic producers like tariffs when they're, the world price is below the domestic price. We also note that there are these two deadweight loss triangles, as well as this piece right here, which is the government's tariff revenue. And remember to compute the deadweight loss triangles, we're gonna use the one half base times height formula. So the next question was asking about uh, Greece and Switzerland. And there was a specific question that was saying, suppose that Greece and Switzerland both produce oil and olives. So Greece's opportunity cost of producing a crate of olives is five barrels of oil, while Switzerland's opportunity cost of producing a crate of olives is 10 barrels of oil. So what do you know right away? The first thing you know is that Greece has a comparative advantage in the production of olives because Greece's opportunity cost right here is five barrels of oil. Oops. Is five barrels of oil. So we can see right there, five barrels of oil, whereas Switzerland's opportunity cost of producing a crate of olives is 10 barrels of oil. So Switzerland has a comparative advantage in oil production. Greece has a comparative advantage in the production of olives. So then the next question was asking, what is going to be the gains from trade? Um, so suppose that Greece and Switzerland consider trading olives and oils with each other. Greece can gain from specialization in trade as long as it receives more than five barrels of oil 
for each crate of olives, it exports to Switzerland. And so that information we just found by looking right up here because of Greece's opportunity cost of producing a crate of olives is five barrels of oil. So that is the uh, cost that Greece has to receive for the each crate of olives. Whereas Switzerland can gain from trade as long as it receives more than one tenth crate of olives for each barrel of oil it exports. So that is also received from here, but we're just flipping it. So we're just basically just saying the inverse of 10 barrels of oil for one crate of olives. So then what we know is that any price between five and 10 barrels of oil per crate of olives will be acceptable. And so the terms of trade must be between the opportunity costs of each country. Otherwise, one country would benefit from trade when the other country wouldn't. Okay, so the next question was asking about a question on chapter 10 post-lecture quiz. So this question was kind of getting at the uh, kind of the mechanisms of a market and how, how different the impact is between a command and control policy and a market-based policy. So in this case, you have the three firms. You have three, they produce three units of pollution each and they have nine total units of pollution. So then you're given this table here, which tells you that the cost of each uh, unit of, or the cost of pollution reduction for each unit of pollution. So in this instance, it costs, costs firm X $130 to reduce pollution by one unit. It costs them $165 to reduce pollution by two units. And for firm X, it costs them $220 to reduce pollution by three units. Okay. So then we're told for the first method that every single firm must reduce pollution by two units. So everyone's gonna have to reduce the first and the second unit of pollution. So what's that gonna look like? So that is a command and control policy. And so basically I've just kind of reproduced the table here to give you the total. So we just basically take the 130, 165, 90, 115, 600 and 750. We just add them all up right here. And we see that the total cost of reducing pollution by two units per firm is this amount right here, 1,850. Okay, so that was for method one, which was a command and control policy. So now we're gonna talk about method two. Method two is the market-based policy and it's tradable permits. So in this case, each firm is given permits and each firm is given two permits. So we can see here that the cost of pollution to each firm again, but this time we'll notice something a little different. So this time I've actually numbered each cost of pollution based on the dollar amount. So remember, we have six total units that the government wants to get pollution reduced by. So we have here for firm X, they have the first unit of pollution reduction, the cheapest. Then they also have the second. Then it's gonna jump up to firm X for the first unit, then back to firm Y for the third, up to firm X for the second, then to firm X for the third, and then firm Z has the most expensive. So what is the dollar value that the government should target to get six units of pollution reduced? So we can see here that the sixth unit of pollution is $220, so that's the cost. So the government should target the pollution permits at between 212 and $219. Um, and those numbers are kind of arbitrary numbers that the question gives you. 
So basically the government just needs to target something that is in the range of $220 because that is the sixth unit of pollution. So what we see then is we see that in this instance, firm X is not going to sell any of its pollution permits. So they are going to have to reduce pollution by two units. So then that is their total cost to them. Whereas because firm Y has very cheap uh, pollution reduction, much, much cheaper than firm Z, as we can see here, firm Y is going to sell a permit to firm Z. So firm at Y is going to have to reduce pollution by three units, whereas firm Z is only going to have to reduce pollution by one unit. And because of that, what's going to happen then is the total cost of pollution reduction is going to be $1,000. $240. And so note, that is cheaper than the command and control method of 1850 So tradable permits or market-based solutions are actually sometimes a decent uh, response to getting pollution to be reduced. And the key here is that market-based permits are only a good idea if you are able to continue to bear some of the cost of pollution. So as long as it's okay that there's some pollution existing, market-based market -based scenarios are a good way to go. But if you want to reduce all pollution, they're not a good way to go. Command and control methods are actually the best. Okay. So for the next one, it was a question about common resources. So I kind of just wanted to quickly talk about that common resources are not excludable, but rival. And so what does that mean? So that means that you can basically, you cannot prevent free riders from using them. So the problem then is that people have an incentive to use it before others use it because it's rival. So basically, let's think of like a really extreme scenario. So imagine I am a fisher person and I am, and there's a common resource of fish. So my incentive is to go out and fish up all of the fish so no one else can get them. And the reason for that is because it's rival. So if you or someone else catches any of the fish, I will get less of the fish. So that's why it's in each person's individual incentive to consume or get as much of the good as possible. So the best method that we use to try to prevent this is government to have government regulate the good so it's not overused. Um, and I kind of already explained the fish example, but an interesting one is so fish overfishing in international waters. And basically why this is an issue is because no country has the ability to stop fishing in international waters. So unless a group of countries or nations get together to regulate fishing, all nations have an incentive to overfish and get all of the fish before the other nations get the fish. So that's kind of the problem um, of the tragedy of the commons and why government regulation is almost always the best way to fix that. Okay. Then the next question was kind of asking about just goods in general and kind of how to classify them. So I actually kind of borrowed this from the internet. Uh, and I think it's a really good way to kind of think about the, uh, the goods and how to classify them in what some of the goods are. So you can see here that we have private goods, which are excludable and rival. So you can think of things like clothes, cosmetics, electronics. The price is the exclusion in their rival because if I go to a store and buy all of the iPads, you cannot go to that store right after me and buy any iPads because I bought them all. Whereas a club good is excludable 
but non-rival. So like telephones or electricity in specifically telephones in the sense of like uh, the old person telephone where they have like a landline um, or telephone service. So they're excludable because you have to pay for them, but they're non-rival because if I am using, if I'm calling someone, you can also call someone. My use of the network doesn't impact your use. And the same is true of electricity. So if I turn on all of the lights in my house, you can still turn on lights in your house. There's no difference there. The next one is our common goods. So kind of what we were just talking about, like public libraries or playgrounds. So they're not excludable. So there's no way to exclude people from using them, but they are rival. And they're rival because if I go to the library and check out a book that you wanted, you can't go to that same library and check out the book. That's just not possible. And then finally, we have public goods. So they're non-excludable and non-rival. And so those are goods like roads, bridges, or dams that you can't exclude people from using. And they're also non-rival because if I'm using a road, unless it's very trafficy, y um, you can also use the road and that doesn't impact my usage. So kind of as a follow-up to this then, um, someone was asking about Facebook, which is actually a really interesting question. And I got this quote from an article in the Financial Times where they were talking about Facebook and how Facebook is a tragedy of the commons. And so basically, what they're saying is that a better way to think of Russian political ads, extremist videos, fake news, and the rest is to think of it as polluters of a common resource. And so the term for this is tragedy of the commons. So what we talked about before. And the reason is that open ecosystems are things that are free to use, which in this case, Facebook is free to use, um, are openly shared by entire communities. And because of that, they tend to get despoiled or they tend to basically get destroyed. And the reason is because the inherent interest is for us to get as much benefit as possible before the resource is used up. So that's why any sort of common resource, this category right here, usually it's really important that the government have some sort of hand in either providing the service or regulating it. So it does not get completely used up. Okay. Then the next one was asking about a question where we were talking about the market for gasoline. Let me move that down. Okay. So the important thing with this is that for negative externalities, you'll note that the quantity here, I can stop moving it. So the quantity initially, so the green is the initial market outcome. So this quantity here is too high and the price here is too low because the social cost shifts the supply curve up because when you include the negative externality, the supply curve should move up, which should decrease the quantity in the market and increase the price of the good. And unless that occurs, there's going to be a negative impact on individuals who are not in the, that specific market. And so specifically for the market for gasoline, if you don't own a car, you are still negatively impacted by people driving the car. And you're negatively impacted through the emissions that the vehicle has, through the noise of the vehicles, through traffic, um, through accidents. So really, really important there that the negative impact is the reason why it's called a negative externality, because it impacts individuals who are not in the specific market. Because if you don't own a car, you're still negatively impacted by climate change, for example. So that's why negative externalities have this social cost that moves the supply curve up and reduces the quantity in the market and increases the price in the market. 
okay. And so for the final one, it was a question that was from one of the, uh, I believe it was from the homework. So it was saying three residents of Smallville are considering a fireworks display. So the first individual, Clark, values this public good at $80. Lana values it at 50. And Pete, who dislikes fireworks, values it at negative 30. So fireworks cost the town $120 or $40 per person. The efficient outcome for this town would be, so the first thing you need to do when you see a question like this is add up everyone's benefit. So you add up for Clark, it's 80, Lana, it's 50, and Pete, it's negative 30. So the total value to the town is $100. So because fireworks cost the town $120, what that means then is that the town should not provide the fireworks because $120 is less than $100. So the benefit to the town is only $100, but the cost is $120. And so even though Clark and Lana value fireworks more than $40 because Pete values them at negative 30, that effectively means that the total value to the town is less than the cost of providing fireworks to the town. Okay, and that is the last question. So just a reminder, next week, I'm gonna be doing a review the entire session. Um, so I'll send out more emails about that, but basically anyone can attend um, if they want to. Uh, the other thing is just, you know, I hope everyone is staying well and staying sane today. Um, you know, just make sure you're getting, uh, you know, making sure that you are staying well is really important. So with that, have a great rest of your week. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, either ask them in the chat or unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, so you have a question about the total cost graph. Um, what if they ask about marginal costs? Yes, okay. So if they ask about marginal costs, um, let me <clears throat> let me show you really quickly what that would look like. And if you all don't have any questions on that or um, don't have any questions on marginal costs, you don't have to stick around, feel free to leave, but I will um, review the marginal cost piece. So for marginal cost, let me, share my screen. Okay, so the thing with marginal cost is that you need to remember is that you need to have the change in total cost over the change in quantity. So if we remember marginal cost is equal to change in total quantity over change in quantity, let's take a look back at that graph and see if we can calculate um, the costs. And I'm gonna go back to that graph uh, right now. Okay. So to compute the marginal cost, let me see if I can get that to come back up. Okay, so kind of an example like this. So you're basically, what you need here to compute the marginal cost is because in this case, you have the marginal cost curve, so you're good. But if you didn't have the marginal cost curve, what you would need to first find is you would need to first find the total costs. So in this case, the we have the average total cost, so we would need to divide that by the quantity. And we also would need the quantity itself. So, if we're looking at something like, let's say, maybe just even a basic graph, but so we would need the MC is equal to the change in TC total cost over change in quantity. So we always need the total costs and the quantity to compute marginal costs. Does that answer your question for uh, marginal cost?
were you looking for um, kind of like an example on how to calculate marginal cost or um, how to find it in a specific example? And on the, was there a specific graph that you were thinking about? Did the graph you were thinking about, um, did it have marginal cost already? Yeah, so um, the only time that they would ask you to find marginal cost is usually if they give you a table because on the graph, um, on most graphs, you're gonna be, let me go back to that one really quickly. So most graphs, you're actually gonna be given the marginal cost curve and then you can just locate it on that graph. Does that help answer your question a little bit with the marginal cost? Awesome, okay. Perfect. Does anyone else have any other questions that they wanted to ask before uh, I sign off for the day? Awesome. Well, if not, have a great rest of your week and I will send out more information about the review next week that I'm gonna be doing uh, during class time.